Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Earth Observation Based Emergency Mapping for Local and Regional Risk Management. So I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Stephen Clendillon. He's the director of CERTID iCube Laboratory. And so today he'll be providing an overview of how CERTID's rapid, rapid mapping service works as well as recent results and developments. So CERTID is based in Strasbourg, France, and it manages and produces geo information during emergency mapping activations for user communities in the Copernicus Emergency Management Service System, as well as for local and regional risk managers and the insurance world. CERTID is therefore involved in developing solutions, for example, for 3D storm damage mapping, flood mapping, particularly in urban areas, um, as well as, for example, systemic lake monitoring and ground movement. And just before I pass the floor to Stephen, just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can feel free to use the chat or the Q&A box. Um, and there was a slide that was available, um, which showed stop. you. I can stop. Go ahead, reshare re if you want. It's fine, Stephen. Go ahead and uh, and share. The uh, Ali will explain how to activate the caption. That was, that was a bit too enthusiastic. <laughs> it's no problem at all. Um, so uh, there is a uh, on your screen at the bottom. You can see. Um, you can. Um, click the CC button and it should activate the captions for you in the language of your choosing. And uh, so therefore, without further ado, uh, Stephen, I will go ahead and pass the floor to you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here to present uh, rapid mapping with a major emphasis on Copernicus, right? which, is our, uh, which is our main uh, domain of activity. Okay, um, my name is Stephen Clandell, and as said, I'm using a, a lot of work done by Jérôme because we also have training. Uh, we also do a lot of training, and uh, Jérôme has uh, put the backbone of this presentation together with a nap. Okay, I'm going to move on. So, basically, yes. How can emergency mapping through Copernicus CMS uh, aid in crisis management? Well, the idea is that we send geographic information to people quickly and uh, this has been set up over a number of years i'll just go and give a small bit of a talk about us uh, there'll be uh, most most of it's going to be about, about copernicus and i'll be also talking a small bit about circuits and our roles within that we've been around since 1986 uh, we're a technological transfer and service platform in remote sensing as part of the University of Strasbourg and the iCube Laboratory. There's about 23 of us, which is quite a number of people uh, to keep going. Uh, I won't go further into that. What is a disaster? Well, it's something that occupies us a lot. It's uh, a mixture between a uh, when a hazard, exposure and vulnerability all come together to create um, uh, something that we, um, a mess somewhere. Uh, a disaster. So it can be climate or uh, ha the hazard can be linked to climate I issues. It can be linked to earth the Earth's activity. I'm a geologist, by the way. I'm, I'm a geologist that escaped geology, but yes, uh, geology still interests me. Uh, and there's also human, uh, human activity related disasters. M um, and of course, there's a good mixture between them. There's, Climate and human activities, of course, are slightly related. But anyway, that's not really what we're here for. The Copernicus system. Well, we know probably the disaster management cycle a bit more than myself. Well, we focus to a large extent on the event, but there are aspects within Copernicus and post-event and pre-event. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit too, and I'll try and probably We'll work through that ahead of focusing on the actual event work itself. Copernicus, it is the only system that I know of anyway, I think it is therefore the only system that has and deal uh, that has solutions and deals with all 
parts of the disaster cycle, meaning uh, during, uh, during an event with rapid mapping, which is standard, uh, uh, on-demand standardized and uh, is very fast, we do within that very little reference mapping anymore, but a lot of delineation and grading maps, plus uh, more and more situation reporting, which is basically bringing in ancillary information from outside to enrich uh, and improve our products. Then there's risk and recovery, which is the risk part is the pre-event part. Uh, you analyze the hazard, potential hazard, the uh, risk, and the vulnerability to that. Plus the also um, how uh, how uh, an area rec uh, recuperates after after an event. So that's the risk and recovery mapping. Then there's sections on early warning with uh, both uh, floods and fires being dealt with to a certain extent. These are important inputs. Uh, we get EFAS, GLOFAS warning systems to allow us to pre-program or uh, program and advance satellite data. So we get ahead. It's quite important. Right, the, what can we do? Uh, what can remote sensing or a service like Copernicus bring to people dealing with uh, disasters? In the pre-event, we need to start up getting databases together, basically, and which will help us in risk eval uh, evaluation, mitigation, prevention, training of people to understand how to use the data. Um, and in, in their, we, we've often done in the past uh, training programs with uh, people uh, uh, within scena uh, disaster scenarios uh, to help them understand how to use the data that's coming in. Uh, and also this preparation, of course. I'm not going to go through everything. You, you'll get a PowerPoint after this. As part of this, okay, that, those are list of text here. I like images. Maps you can see here, for example, an economic exposure map. Uh, we we did that for uh, a World Bank study, and uh, you can also do uh, risk indexes or just basic uh, just basic information from uh, topographic maps uh, is important. Uh, getting the best digital elevation models already in a database and easily accessed. Uh, uh, during an event is really important as well. So a lot there's a lot of stuff that you can do um, in the pre-event phases that, that needs to be done with them. During an event, what can we help? And well, it's not the data itself. It's not us. We don't make the decisions, but we can try and help people make decisions in, um, in locating a place where where things are happening so and this would help uh, for example civil protection agencies and whatever and other uh, other associate agencies to come uh to the systems of the population uh also in uh, logistics we i know that civil protection agencies have made decisions about sending such and such a uh a level of assist assistance and or uh, resources to given areas depending on the the damage scene or the or the event itself. Situational analysis is important overall and running monitoring during a, an event. That's all quite important and we can give a hand in that. We don't just need to use, we don't just use satellite data by the way. We can use aerial, drone, whatever uh, lidar data that can can help us. So any any data that can be used to uh, to uh, derive geographic information is useful here, and so that we can then send the information, uh, send that information very quickly. The post, the post phase, well, we're talking about risk and recovery, recovery part. So it's rehabilitating, and uh, it's monitoring of the uh, of the rehabilitation of uh, an area, the reconstruction of buildings. For example, over Bumadas in Algeria, we analyzed that or, over a period of 10 years, which is interesting. Uh, see what's happening. Uh, feedback, it's important to get feedback as well uh, during the event and from the, from the ground so that we can also help uh, 
optimize the service we're providing. And the, we can help people do risk evaluations uh, and also try and mitigate or prevent, uh, or work on trying to mitigate or prevent uh, the next disaster. Well, not geophysical, but definitely um, other ones can be, you can help prevent them. Okay, this is an example of a post event one. I'll show you lots of events uh, imagery afterwards. This is a compilation we put together for uh, of a num over a number of dates on the the analysis, the monitoring of the rebuilding of Samata. Um, so there are buildings that are under construction, under recon uh, so they'd be new. Uh, under reconstruction, you built whatever, okay, and over a period of time. So this can help uh, people understand what's happening on the ground, whether actually whether the, the money is being well spent there, because uh, people, uh, countries send a lot of money into these places and they like to know what's happening. Here, actually, the Dutch were more efficient than the French in getting, uh, in getting buildings to get uh, back, back up and people into solid homes. We also look at vegetation recovery monitoring. For example, after a hurricane, uh, hurricanes can flatten everything, uh, including buildings. And uh, here we're talking about vegetation crops and therefore to see whether an area is beginning to be agriculturally, act uh, agriculturally active again, uh, to see whether uh, or, or not. And that's important. So we're, we're, we did this in Haiti. We've done this in a num number of other places. Uh, at the request of uh, international agencies. Okay, now I'm going to focus more on rapid mapping. We work, uh, CERTED works uh, mostly within Copernicus Emergency Management Service and the International Charter. The other ones I won't mention, I'm just leaving them there. Uh, and I'll have a most of uh, focus on the Copernicus with uh, the International Charter as a source of satellite data for this within this presentation. I'll just look at the charter. It's uh, basically it's a um, best effort on a best effort basis. Satellite um, space agencies provide uh, data whenever there's a disaster, whenever which means whenever a uh, a user, an authorized user, requ requests uh, imagery and or value-added mapping services over a given area. And they'll all, they'll all focus their acqu acquisitions on that if they can. So it's there's quite a number. And just giving you an idea, we work within Copernicus, as I said, in the Charter. Uh, most of them are nature-related disasters we work with, floods, fires, earthquakes, the worst are tsunamis, I would have to say. But some some of the earthquakes can be horrible. Uh, but the most frequent ones are fire and flood, particularly uh, when we're concentrating on Europe and Copernicus. Uh, we also get yeah wind storms uh, that thankfully are mostly outside of Europe, and uh, for Europeans I mean, and some geophysical stuff plus a humanitarian crisis. We don't get much of that. They often go into other Copernicus services the requests. Copernicus EMS, I said it's all three phases. In early warning, there's a uh, drought monitoring, there's forest fire uh, danger and extent mapping, plus uh, our hydrological warning and, predict, um, and prediction of floods. We, for example, when we, are, we often in rapid mapping, just underneath there, we get alerts when it goes above a, a scale of four, uh, we get uh, an automatic alert to go and acquire data over a given area. That's handy because it gives us a heads up and we can get data acquired earlier than if, it, if they waited until the event itself. So th this is predict um, prediction leading to, uh, le leading to uh, the activity of at least acquiring the data and that can lead on to a mapping. With the wrap up mapping, and I won't go into risk and recovery because I've done enough of it. Okay. Risk and recovery, just uh, an outline here. 
plow mass, land slide, risk analysis, soil erosion, um, grading monitoring, lots of different uh, products that are much more, that take much longer to do than rapid mapping. They require more information uh, and databases. And this is the kind of thing that we would do uh, often before or after, but mostly after an event. Most people, most of us react when there, an event has happened. And the same with uh, anything linked to floods. You have water depth, which we're doing now, and I'll go into it uh, in uh, rapid mapping. Maximum water extent, multi-temporal flood extension, and other and impact statistics and things like that. This is the kind of thing you can uh, you can request. It takes a number of days, but it's uh, it's a fairly fast service within the standard uh, uh, risk and recovery now uh, service. I'm still. Rapid mapping. We're no longer talking about days, but hours. We have a number of hours. For a first estimate map, we have two hours to produce a map. It's extremely fast. Uh, we have very little time. Uh, and for delineation and grading, well, for, uh, it goes from seven to uh, seven to 10 hours uh, from the time of a satellite data reception. So it's extremely quick. We also, uh, to do this, we, we need a 24 seven service with people on call. Uh, we're well-trained, you know, and uh, who, who know when they're going to be on call. So we have a lot of on-call planning and stuff like that because we, we do night and weekend work uh, basically continuously uh, when we're requested. And this can, this can happen over days and days. So you can't have the same people. So you need a good, strong team. Copernicus, it's European funding. I'm actually proud to work for it, but that's another point. Uh, coordinated by the GRC. We work with them a lot. Um, the, the authorized users, I mentioned that uh, within the context of the charter, it's the same idea here. You have national focal points that are, have the, um, the EC, uh, EC services, plus other international institutions uh, that uh, have the right to trigger the service. Others can probably um, uh, phone up, but depending on the disaster, they'd be accepted or not, because Europe has interests, of course, outside Europe. So um, yeah, so those are the authorized users, very important people. They give us feedback, they pay for us, because the, it's European people paying uh, uh, tax, uh, taxes that pay for this service through the commission and uh, whatever. Okay, so we have, a certain number of countries, actually, this is not up to date anymore. I should, it's nine companies throughout Europe, and you'd have to add in Greece to that list. Um, and you would basically get a lot of us, yes, so all the different countries. So there's quite a number of companies working together to ensure the service. The service is managed by EGOS, and helped, but um, we helped in helping managing it, particularly in service evolution. So I'll mention later. Our summers tend to be exceptionally busy. Uh, why? Because there's a lot of uh, fires quite often, unfortunately. And uh, also, you can also have fires in one place, floods in another. Or uh, once the fire season is uh, finished, you can then have huge uh, fl flooding events, particularly around the Mediterranean basin. But yeah, and also into middle, uh, in, into Central Europe. But anyway, Yes, we have a peak quite often uh, in, in the summer. So we have to be very careful about vacations <laughs> and organizing that. What's a classic production cycle? I don't know whether you're interested, but here you go. I mentioned first estimate products. So basically we have two hours now to produce that. We would try and find an archive image uh, that's therefore already been taken some uh, by some uh, by, 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 by some uh, uh, satellites somewhere, try and get it, transform that into a, a map really quickly, a mapping information, geographic information. And then we'd start, if it's not already out, we'd be starting to, we'd start doing delineation and delineation monitoring products to, uh, to end often with a grading product. So that's basically cycle. So we often do monitor, particularly with fires, we do a lot of monitoring. Unfortunately, they tend to keep going a while. So I mentioned 
delineation or disaster extent uh, delineation plus monitoring and grading. These are two things we often do. Uh, the grading is really, really important because I, most of us, uh, if something happens out in the wilderness, we don't care, care as much, unfortunately, or fortunately, as if it if, if impacts urban areas, transportation facilities, infrastructure, basically. And uh, these, there's a lot of damage assessment involved in this. A lot, lot of, um, a lot of work to get things done. Um, so this is a minute, very high resolution. Uh, uh, analysis for if to really uh, get our acts together on um, building by building damage. Most of the cases we're moving towards urban block, but we'll see. Burnt areas, just going through the portfolio again a little bit, see what it looks like. And this should change. Yeah. This is a monitoring cycle, uh, a flood monitoring cycle in Greece. Uh, the last last year you can just see that so over a period of days we've been monitoring uh the the flood as it came in and as it left as it uh, ebbed so um this is our base uh this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis whenever activated harder is i was mentioning damage damage assessments uh grading so here we're grading the damage on a building by building basis in here was Morocco. And you all probably heard about the earthquakes last year. So this was quite hard because you're talking about using uh, analyzing damage in buildings that are, ba are ba basically built from the same material as the um, uh, as the earth around them. So yeah, it was quite impressive uh, the amount of work. Um, we, you need to train your eyes on this and to do it quickly as well. Um, this, this is the kind of thing you don't want to have. Massive event in Libya where a dam burst and basically uh, destroyed a, um, a good part of the town down, downstream. Yes, a huge amount of work on, uh, on both facilities, but mostly building uh, building by building basis. It was, uh, it was, done, it was incredible. Uh, buildings were just absolutely destroyed, removed a lot of them, particularly in the red areas. So this is what we try and do. Um, I'd like to mention that the Copernicus uh, service now has a very good activation viewer. Um, and you, you can zoom in onto all of the layers. You can also download them. So you can zoom onto them, play around with them. Uh, therefore, to see, uh, try and uh, see different aspects. All the different zones are uh, of interest are or areas of interest are there of a given activation, um, and uh, you can also download uh, download these layers. It's all free and open. Plus, there's the situation reporting, which gives a, another another view on what's ongoing. Production status is important, as it informs everybody uh, of where uh, where we are in production, what kind of uh, what kind of products are coming up? A big event was, uh, and also an extremely long-term event, was the following of a volcanic eruption and the lava flows in La Palma. But just to give you an idea, this was over uh, over months. So sometimes, some, sometimes our events are extremely fast, but other events can be over a period of time, like this one, and I, uh, I well over a thousand buildings, I think, got uh, uh, dam were damaged by this thing. So it was actually quite important to monitor this over time. And this is other; these are other views on the on the right. You have a bit of a, a view of a, of the of a damage assessment uh, linked to its basic. It's disappeared a bit now. We're changing that to land use, but it's uh, it was basically fire severity. Uh, on the left, you can see the spread on uh, on an observation by observation basis of the fire over time in the French lawn. But this was done within the emergency service, uh, uh, Copernicus Emergency Service, as you can see. So we have different products coming online. 
And I really do uh, like the fact that we're exploring more and more how to communicate the, the information to users, to everybody, um, through this activation bureau. Very recently, CERT was heavily involved in, in that's there from my team, we're heavily involved in working on something that you might think is simple, is calculating water depth from an observed event, therefore the water extent of, uh, uh, of a flood, for example, and a digital, digital terrain model. The only thing is that each and every event has its own, uh, uh, and data has its own errors. And therefore you have to take all of this into account while doing it. And it was quite, a, it, it's still ongoing. Uh, to a certain extent, we're, we're improving. I think we've got to something quite mature and it's the only service I know that does it uh, rapidly and provides this uh, water depth analysis uh, in, in an observed event. Uh, therefore, the flood observed event uh, within a, within the seven hours. So it's extremely extremely rapid, and it gets just an idea of where the water is uh, uh, is the deepest. I'm involved in service evolution. Now we're going from our we have issues. Um, we can't get into urban areas particularly well, particularly with radar data. So we're now going to move from. Uh, water depth calculated on the left, you can see it's uh, basically interpolated within uh, sectors that we can see that are not really uh, cl in close to buildings or whatever. On the right, we've interpolated, extrapolated, uh, and tried to um, model how it would look if we, uh, if we had a few points coming from perhaps photographs, uh, geotype photographs, uh, and whatever or water gauges, what, um, and you pump that in to try and then spread out the, and extrapolate the analysis. So we're gonna, we're working on that. This will be next year's service evolution. Hopefully we'll come up with something soon enough. But the idea is to get the flooding into the urban areas and indicate uh, the areas most likely to have been affected. Because sometimes they'll no longer have, when we get there and get an image, we'll no longer be able to see the actual water because it might have, um, and might the flooding might have ebbed, but not always. So anyway, that's one thing we're working on. And also, I was talking about um, social media, etc. If they can give us information, we're, our idea is to use something or even a satellite image, uh, partial satellite um, coverage of some flooding in a in an urban area to see whether we can extrapolate from that using <laughs> cellular automatic comes from game theory. So it's basically using uh, some very basic, simple um, rules to then and then model out, extrapolate out these uh, uh, the areas that most likely are flooded. So. That's something we're heading into uh, next year as well. So we're going to go, uh, trying to go from outside the urban area into it, but also trying to get something in the area, in the urban area and to see uh, given a certain water depth, for example, in a given area, what could that affect if we extrapolated it out? So it's a, a lot of it, uh, the integration of ancillary data um, social media mentioned water gauges, flood risk maps, precipitation for modeling. So we're we're working a lot on this, and uh, it's something to look forward to next year. Urban flood modeling. It's the big it's the big challenge for next year. I think I've finished basically. Um, the presentation, overall presentation, the kind of things we produce and. Uh, the products we deliver within Copernicus and other uh, frameworks. And um, we are giving an idea. We're also working on 3D, the 3D modeling of forestry damage following windstorm, wind, uh, windstorms and stuff like that. That's with the, that's really very much 3 um, R&D work, but uh, hopefully we, 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 it's more uh, applied research. We have an idea of how to do it, but we have to make it operational that's very different it's a bit always a big challenge 
And there are other things also we're looking into how to use uh, uh, thermal imagery uh, very quickly to give an indication of the impact of heat in an, in an area and therefore the damage of that uh, during fires. Not just and not just on the objects were burnt, but maybe uh, uh, maybe things uh, like vineyards and whatever around uh, surrounding burnt areas. So I'll stop there and let you ask me questions if you're if you're still awake. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we actually have more people now than when the webinar first started, which is a great sign. So I think everyone is still very engaged. Um, so I have a, a question in the chat. Um, so the question is, are you going to implement AI recognition to find destroyed buildings and to compare the satellite images? Okay. At the moment, we can't. Why? We can probably use AI, and it's, it's quite mature, I would say, to um, map buildings themselves. To actually map and consistently and operationally map the damage in buildings, it's really complex. Why? Because we often get uh, we often get imagery taken at extremely different uh, angles. So therefore, when you're looking from the left or from the right at a higher angle, uh, tall buildings, for example, are projected completely uh, the upper, um, the opposite direction. And AI doesn't do that yet. It, it doesn't rectif uh, rectify all of that yet. Also, uh, we've seen we've seen it over Turkey. We've seen it over. Uh, um, it was completely useless over Morocco, um, but we saw over Turkey premises of extremely good mapping of buildings, and that's uh, that for us is quite good. So, for the moment, it's a partial solution to certain aspects. It's, uh, we're using AI more and more in flood mapping. We already use, uh, well, it's uh, advanced machine learning. So yeah, it fits into AI. Um, and we're trying to expand, uh, try to use AI as well in fire extent mapping because the human eye is still the best thing uh, around to interpret images. Particularly for the more the sparser, more complicated areas, or in areas of high relief with a, um, a very much varying um, illumina illumination, uh, uh, with lots of shadowing or not, or extremely exposed surfaces, whatever. So, yeah, we're trying we're trying to use it because we'd like to because we'd like to do more faster, definitely. But it's not there yet. <laughs> Would you have expected me to say yes? No. Thank okay. You. Another question. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, please uh, feel free to enter your questions in the chat or in the Q and A box. Um, in the meantime, uh, Stephen, I actually have a, a question for you. Um, as you are a partner in the AWARE project, a project that uh, Ina is also involved in, I was wondering if you would like to um, talk about the potential opportunities for synergies between uh, Copernicus EMS and um, Galileo Emergency Warning Satellite Service. Um, for any um, of the participants who may not be familiar with Galileo Emergency Warning Satellite Service, we have a previous webinar which talked about the Stellar project and results. Um, so you could uh, learn a little bit more uh, if you are interested. Um, so Stephen, would you like to um, talk about any potential opportunities there? Yeah, I think it couldn't go. We're, we're okay, we're involved in aware to try explore possibilities. I can't say how the commission is, are going to um, integrate this, but what I can say is well, we have a few ideas, maybe, where perhaps early warning could be made um, faster through in-situ in alert systems uh, alerting us through Galileo, through using uh, satellite uh, communications and stuff like that. And perhaps as well, 
in the case of an uh, of an event, getting information out to people. But I don't know whether they want to do that or not. But that, to my mind, that could be possible. For example, sending, uh, making people aware that there is information out there. Uh, that that's uh, mapping the event that's occurring close to them. Or um, yeah, giving them links to that because I don't think uh, I don't you can't send an, a map out that'd be just too much, but you could send links out um, and the alerts basically that if we're working on somewhere, um, for <laughs> oh, we often have issues between uh, which is crazy I find between um, uh, member states where for example one event we know is affecting one country and we know it's affecting the other, but the other doesn't want to uh, trigger. Uh, so we can uh, perhaps use our um, the fact that we've been triggered for an event and spread that out faster to member states uh, to, um, and, and or to the public, depending on how the member states want to do it. I can't, uh, I'm not replacing the member states here on their decision making. But yeah, I, th I think it's... Um, alerts and uh, links to information so that people can be informed on what's happening. Don't know, that's my idea. And our idea is now to explore that possibility with the commission. That's Ooh. great. So I don't know whether it's great, but it's something to explore. <laughs> um, it depends on uh, political sens uh, sensitivities and lots of other things like that, we'll see. But maybe you could use, um, maybe, for example, EFAS uh, alerts could be uh, vehicled through um, through the aware system or whatever. I like the idea of um, informing the population, but the what to inform, the how. Like uh, within aware, there's this idea of uh, sending information out into onto bus, uh, uh, electronic bus uh, publicity panels. Uh, you never know. You could actually inform people through that um, through this uh, about what's happening. Um, so it's something we're going to explore. Thank uh, you. It's for really it. interesting. It's really interesting. Sorry to be involved and in talking to a completely different domain. Uh, and also, uh, the commission has been pushing for the Gal Galileo to link up with Copernicus. Hopefully, we'll get something out of it here. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, we have another question in the chat. Uh, can you please share some information about the hardware and human staffing side of Copernicus analysis production? Oh, okay. So, we have within the consortium okay we have an on-call uh duty officer is on call 24 7. that's the principal contact the same it's the same number then we use a a telephone switchboard to get to distribute that to whoever's on call um inserted then we would actually have a backup uh, to that on-call order um and so we would have two people when we're on call to to manage uh to manage activations and this could be up to we've seen up to 14 13 14 ongoing activations at any given time uh so we we definitely need two people in there so we would have two people available then in terms of production sites we have four 24 7 production sites with uh, two to three people per production site. And that can be bumped up in the day, of course. Uh, so we uh, have quite a bit of capacity and we have an extra um, an extra site. <laughs> that's um, 16, seven. So that's quite a lot of people that can also be bumped up. You can't have too many people on call all the time, but the idea is to be sort of flexible. And uh, if things, re um, for example, during the summer, we ensure also uh, uh, reinforcement uh, people that can, um, they don't know what they're going to do, whether it's going to be managing activations or um, helping 
uh, the production sites, but they are available to intervene and boost uh, and boost production. So, um, hello, my question. Okay, that's uh, that's that's how we try and do it. We ha we can't have everybody on call all the time, so we try and have um um. A, a bit, we need backup and we can call on extra people to help when it's necessary. Next one is, next question. Yes, the next high question. Resolution. Yes, how is it decided what high resolution pictures to be taken, picked and chosen and analyzed for the daily subscribed mail? It requires massive knowledge base and extra energy as well. Okay, so we basically have scenarios um it means that people have let if for example we're talking about known damage to buildings we need vhr uh what we call very high resolution data and we're getting down to 30 centimeter data at the moment uh in terms of satellite data okay uh sometimes you also get a bit and a, a slightly delayed often but we also get um aerial drone whatever imagery and that can go down to a few centimeters so but it, it's all that's all linked to damage to uh the built environment we call it that way therefore it doesn't have to be necessarily 100 percent it's in rural areas but damage to the built environment it's wasted on large uh rural areas we don't do it there rural and for large rural areas you're talking um talking about imagery um, in around the three to four meters and upwards. So uh, that would be for large uh, uh, large floods outside urban areas. Uh, but we also combine them because sometimes you'd be wanting to do, have uh, an overall view um, that you won't be request. You can't request extremely high resolution over vast areas. It just doesn't exist really, uh, or it's not delivered quickly enough. Um, it's uh, it's it, it's an equilibrium to find. So what we often do is uh, we have a slightly less um precise imagery over wide areas, and then we'll focus on urban areas uh with the VHR data, which is fifty generally fifty centimeters to thirty centimeters. I hope that answers that question. The next one. Hello, my question is the. We don't continuously produce, ah, CMS does through the global flood monitoring, uh, uh, global, global flood monitoring, you, it's, is it continuous? It's debatable, but it uses central one data that is acquired continuously. And whenever there's a flood and it is over that area, it will acquire those data and they will be very quickly transformed into flood, into fl uh, flood mapping. Uh, so do we do it continuously? During an event, we do things, whenever imagery arrives, we transform it into geographic information. With the situational uh, analysis, we will also get ancillary data in and then compose a sort of reporting on that. And that can be that can be done outside of the standard satellite image uh, mapping uh, production so that can be a bit more continuous but I don't know what you mean by continuous there but it's on a very regular basis let's put it back so it's more period um, yeah it's uh, whenever we get an image in we will update it it's very rare to find something that's going to provide us information continuously although um, in a R&D aspect, we're going to be looking into um, imagery taken on bridges, et cetera, in France to, well, hopefully we'll be doing it. It's a, it's, <coughs> we have to win the project. To see how, um, how the situation is evolving close to these bridges, because bridges can provide, uh, can, along with debris, actually lead to um, a flooding of its own accord because the water backs up. And we would like to know, uh, we need to know that kind of thing. So this kind of information can come in quick uh, on a regular basis. We could also get 
water gauges, which is something we ha I'll have to start looking into to see how, how we can regularly, not necessarily continuously update that. And the ma I'll map out from there. Aristotle, sorry, I don't know. I don't know of it. And what is the overlap with Galileo? Um, I don't believe there's any overlap with Galileo in terms of the satellites we use at all. We use, our satellites are all uh, Earth orbiting, um, nearly every single one of some synchronous or, or, um, Earth orbiting between 600 to 800 kilometers up. Um, so no, I can't, uh, so Galileo to me is communication satellites mostly way up in geostationary orbit, unless I'm wrong, it can be. Is it possible to visit us? Yeah, but not uh, not all the time. Could be things to be doing. <laughs> uh, we could a little bit. Yeah, um, a short visit is possible to be organised. And uh, I like I like chatting to people and showing what we do. That's my that's part of my job. So. Uh, it is possible, but like if I start seeing 50 different people asking for different different things at different times, I will say no. <laughs> it can be organized as a group meeting uh, or a group uh, visit. That's always fun. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Do we have any more questions? Sorry, can somebody tell me what is Aristotle? I'd like to know. And so many tell me. Ah, okay. Well, we work with the ERCC all the time. They are our main, within Copernicus, they are the organization that gives us the stamp to say that this activation is to be taken into account by us and we're to work away on it. The actual scientific partnership behind it, we don't, um, we don't know of. I don't know enough of, and I should probably look into it a bit more. Um, because well, they have such a vast range of activities that uh, I'm quite sure they need um, a huge amount of scientific um, backup in many, many different areas. We try. We, um, I'm involved in the scientific uh, partnership to try and improve our service, the service evolution, and we're working with uh, the GRC to try and improve the service to the ERCC. Um, so I don't know too much about our stuff. Thanks for bringing that up. Is there somebody from the ERCC there? Because I'm really, really, I, I love working, uh, uh, the idea of working uh, working for the RCC. So much work that uh, in the DG Echo. Okay, I don't see anything. Yeah, I'm currently monitoring the chat and the Q&A and I don't see anything. So um, I will go ahead and just conclude the uh, webinar here. Um, and uh, just uh, to say to thank everyone for joining us today for this webinar and thank you so much to Stephen for presenting. Um, you, If you're interested in more webinars uh, by Ina, we will have one on the 21st on understanding e-call legislation and then we will have one on the 9th of April continuing our PSAP innovation series uh, for the protection and rescue center in Zurich. So thank you so much. Um, the materials and the recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our website shortly. And I wish you all a very nice rest of your day.